I'm actually going to be going back to the beginning, uh, the beginning being ontology, this big word that was in the title. And in a sense, what that's about and what I want to ask is, what are attitudes anyway? I'm not sure that we really ever got a straight answer to that question. And to the extent that George did talk about that, I think I'm going to disagree with him. Uh, so anyway, let me give you my take on what attitudes are. I'm going to start by uh, running through the distinction between facts and values. I'll attempt to define attitudes within that context, talk about how feelings, beliefs, values, and attitudes fit together. And then, if time permits, touch on tolerance and uh, what this tells us about how attitudes can change. So it's a central idea in moral uh, philosophy and epistemology for that matter, that there's a distinction between facts and values. And this distinction goes back to the Enlightenment. It's one that's much debated today in philosophical circles. Not everyone agrees that there is a hard and fast uh, separation between them. But I think for our purposes, it is useful to uh, separate the two things. On the one hand, we have matters of fact, that is to say, descriptive statements that can be true or false. And then on the other hand, there are matters of value. And these are statements that either uh, are normative or prescriptive or evaluative. Uh, in one way or another, either explicitly or implicitly, they involve notions such as good or bad, right or wrong, uh, ought or ought not. Uh, in the common wording in survey questions, should or should not. So just to give you some examples, uh, smoking causes cancer. That's a descriptive matter. It may be true. It may be false. Uh, it may be difficult to know whether it's true or false. But uh, if we are social realists, then we think that there is actually a truth to the matter. Uh, on the other hand, smoking should be banned uh, is an evaluation. And that's something that we can argue about. But there's nothing empirically testable about uh, the, the, the should or the should not. To give you a slightly more difficult example, the statement that Mother Teresa was only concerned about others, uh, it's probably difficult to uh, work out. We'd have to agree what we mean by only concerned about others and so on. But I think uh, it's probably fair to say that that's either true or false. Uh, Mother Teresa was an example who says, oh, that's something that I think is an evaluation. You can either take the Hitchens view that uh, she was a pretty nasty character underneath uh, or think that she was saintly, uh, but in any case, there's a debate to be had that's essentially a kind of moral debate uh, about whether she is or isn't an example. Now, there's some potential confusions here. I mean, these two statements may look similar in structure. David Vos is a good scholar. David Vos is a good person. I, I think one is descriptive, the other is evaluative. So we could probably form a list of the criteria what it is to be a good scholar. Uh, and you know, there might be a little bit of argument over the things that go on that list, <coughs> but, uh, things to do with truth, morality, and uh, uh, care, and uh, uh, output, and so on would, would come into it. Uh, and that it may be true or false that I'm a good scholar. With being a good person, uh, that's very much an evaluation. And uh, I, we might ourselves come to some kind of consensus about what it means to be a good person, but I think we would find a consensus possible simply because we live within the same moral community. Uh, and it would be entirely possible for somebody else to say, no, I don't agree at all with that set of criteria. Being a good person means something else, and on that basis, David Vos is rotten, or vice versa. All right. Likewise, and uh, it's another complication, there are things that the philosopher Bernard Williams uh, referred to as thick concepts. That is to say, terms that seem to be descriptive, but on the other hand, carry a kind of uh, evaluative force. So uh, the notion of being considerate, for example, uh, is such that if you met a certain number of uh, uh, criteria, you could judge somebody to be considered, considerate, but then immediately would come to uh, a sort of evaluation of the person as 
the result. And there are lots of other terms, some of which I've listed uh, a bit like that. You know, if uh, we're talking about somebody who deserted in the face of battle, then that person is a coward, and then you judge them accordingly. I don't think it's as difficult as all of that to work out what's going on. Mm. It seems to me that these terms have a descriptive and a normative or a evaluative component or dimension. Those can be considered separately. The descriptive uh, statement is indeed either true or false, um, but the judgment we make of that bundle of facts uh, depends on this moral framework that we either do or don't accept. Uh, and indeed, if we want to try to divorce our judgment uh, from all that and simply use the descriptive component, then we can say that we're using one of these uh, words as a technical term. Well, finally now, to the point, what are attitudes? Uh, they're obviously diverse meanings in everyday language. I mean, we say this teenager has a real attitude. Um, I think that's getting a little ways away from what we've been talking about today. Uh, what I want to do is try to formalize this concept in a way that respects normal usage but isn't bound by it and will be helpful in our social scientific uh, discussions. And I'm going to claim that the account I give is actually better at doing that than uh, you know, some of the alternatives. So I think that an attitude is an everyday judgment, that is, it's a normative or an evaluative statement on a specific matter. So what that means it's not is a statement of fact or particular belief. And it's not, likewise, a subjective expression of emotion or feelings or personal preferences. Uh, so I, I think I'm explicitly disagreeing with something that George said at the end of his talk this morning. And to distinguish it from values, it's specific rather than general. So it's concerning some concrete issues rather than abstract principles. Let me give you some examples to try to make this clearer. The statement broccoli is good for you is a belief. It's a descriptive matter that may be true or false. We can uh, agree about what it means for something to be good for you. That has a nutritional connotation. Uh, and within the ordinary meaning of language, I think it's something that's just uh, either correct or incorrect. Attitudes would be things like people should eat more broccoli or Jamie Oliver is right to push broccoli on those poor school children who would rather be eating hamburgers. Um, now, the belief that broccoli is good for you, good for us, good for me, uh, can be used to justify uh, or explain why one holds these other attitudes. But it's not itself an attitude, and it's not part of an attitude. Likewise, I don't like broccoli is a feeling. So that's, again, something else. Uh, or I'd rather watch a DVD than go to the cinema. That's about my own personal preferences. So those don't prescribe how anyone else should feel. I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to the cinema. I'm just saying I don't want to go to the cinema. Uh, if, on the other hand, I say going to the cinema is a waste of time, then I do seem to be legislating for you as well as for me. I'm making a general statement that seems to apply across the board. Uh, and in that case, I think it is an attitude. So what I'm saying, and this is arguably ontology, it's maybe epistemology, but anyway, it's to do with there being three separate realms. I think on the one hand, there are descriptive matters of fact. Those things are true or false. There are evaluative matters about what's good or bad or right or wrong or should or shouldn't happen. Those are the evaluative side of things. And then there's this subjective realm of feelings, emotions, personal preferences. Those are three different areas that I think shouldn't be confused. And in my view, attitudes belong as part of that uh, evaluative or normative uh, realm. Now, the immediate question is, well, how do they uh, differ from values because values clearly uh, are to do with valuations. Well, I think values are general principles. They are more abstract than um, uh, attitudes. 
They're potentially capable of being, if you like, the higher order uh, the judgments from which one then derives the more specific uh, judgments that uh, are embodied in attitudes. Uh, maybe, although I'm not so sure about this, uh, values can, at least within particular situations, be ordered so that we say which ones prevail over others. Uh, to give you a specific example, if we're talking about immigration, that's a topic on which we will have attitudes, pro or con, uh, but the relevant values here are the higher level considerations to do with the importance of in-group loyalty on the one hand or uh, protecting the disadvantaged on the other. Well, where do attitudes come from or how do we explain them? Uh, as I said, they're about things that should or shouldn't happen or good or bad and so on. Uh, they're not derived from descriptive statements and this again is uh, a well-established matter of philosophy. It is an insight that's generally attributed to David Hume, not a Scottish philosopher who uh, said that an ought statement couldn't be derived from an is statement. Uh, but I think statements of fact can provide reasons for statements of value. Uh, there's, and I'll explain what I mean in just a second, a kind of implicit syllogism where these statements of fact are one premise and you need to import the valuation via another premise. So for example, if we believe that women aren't good at fighting, that's a matter that's true or false. It's a descriptive statement. To jump to the attitude, women shouldn't serve in combat, that's a should statement. It's an attitude, it expresses a, a, a judgment. Um, we can't get there directly. You need to have some intervening and generally unstated premise that brings in the normative part. And here, obviously, it's people who aren't good at fighting shouldn't serve in combat. So if we were going to argue about this attitudinal judgment, we might well do so at the level of the top level belief and say, actually, there are a lot of women uh, who are good at fighting. We shouldn't make these kinds of generalizations. Uh, but conceivably, you could argue about that uh, normative uh, premise. So where do attitudes come from? Well, I think they might be driven by beliefs, feelings, values, and some combination. I should say that the relationship between beliefs and attitudes is complicated, uh, as is the relationship between behavior and attitudes. That is, although the beliefs may drive the attitudes, it's perfectly possible for attitudes to work the other way in causality and produce the uh, the attitudes. So, I mean, if it, the attitudes might uh, produce the beliefs, if you have a particular attitude about what's right or wrong, you may then be led to view more sympathetically the mm -hmm. descriptive statements that help to justify that attitude you come to for a different reason. Now, if we look at the, for example, the British Social Attitude Survey, which uh, I think just to give my own endorsement, although Alison hardly needs one, uh, is really a wonderful resource. And if you know there's any uh, single survey you're going to use, it really has to be that one uh, in this domain. Uh, many, many of the questions there have the word should in it. So a lot of demographic questions, a lot of descriptive statements about the person, the respondent, that help to put all this in context. Uh, but then there are an awful lot of what in my terms are pure attitudinal questions. They very often have the word should. Sometimes though they are about beliefs and occasionally about feelings that underpin the attitudes. And I think that's entirely uh, proper that we want to know whether uh, people agree or disagree, for example, that immigrants drive down wages. Not because we think that they thereby give us any information about the truth of that matter. Obviously, they don't. I mean, if we want to know whether immigrants drive down wages, we want to commission a serious study by a labor market economist to go off and do research on that. But we're interested in whether they hold those beliefs because it is clearly related to their attitudes about immigration and can help possibly to explain why they have those attitudes or alternatively what, how they justify those attitudes that they have for some other reason. 
Let me talk a bit about tolerance now, which I think is in some ways a special case of uh, action in a sort of interesting way. In my view, to tolerate something means to be willing to permit a person or a type of person, X, to do a kind of activity, Y. Um, and um, sorry, I seem to have lost something in the middle here. I, I, I'm going to be focusing on, uh, I, I, I think it is possible to talk about tolerating why, where why might be something like abortion or drug use, and to miss out the X. Uh, but that's typically not how we think about tolerance. We think about uh, tolerating some kind of person. So that's uh, the way I'm going to do it. Yes, okay, so I've in the, the middle bits there. Um, so what are the elements of tolerance? Well, we have feelings or beliefs uh, about the types of person X, the types of action Y. Uh, we think that Y is or isn't significant, important. And then we give varying degrees of weight to the different values that uh, may uh, lead us in one direction or another. So uh, I'll just <coughs> give you an example here. Uh, let's imagine a survey question where uh, we're asked whether we think that we should continue to allow Somali refugees to settle in Britain. Well, this is going to be affected by beliefs and feelings about Somalis, beliefs and feelings about immigration, uh, beliefs about the importance of immigration as an issue, uh, and then values connected with all that. So to be more explicit about that, uh, we might have kind of uh, positive or negative views about Somalis. Those are going to be descriptive statements that are true or false. Feelings about Somalis, things like racial prejudice that uh, are relevant. Likewise, beliefs about immigration and its effects. Feelings about immigration. Uh, and then, and here's the slight wrinkle that I think is kind of interesting, beliefs about whether immigration is even something important to worry about. Because if we don't think that actually it makes very much difference one way or another, uh, we might be prepared to see uh, immigration continue, not because we're particularly pro, but simply because we see no strong reason to be anti. And then, of course, there are the values. And these are to do with uh, perhaps higher level concepts, like the importance of free movement, uh, mm. helping the disadvantaged, protecting native uh, interests, or uh, worrying about the impact of people with different values coming in and so on. How does this kind of analysis help? Well, I think that distinguishing feelings, beliefs, values, and attitudes uh, helps us to understand the sources of tolerance and intolerance. Mm. And that to the extent that we want to promote tolerance, it guides us in thinking about what strategy is most likely to succeed. So uh, if beliefs turn out to be important, then we have to think about which ones those are and how they might be changed. If it's a matter of feelings and you know, whether it's prejudice or some other kinds of feelings, then there are a different uh, set of issues around uh, how those might be altered. And then finally, if it really does come down to values and the reason that people differ on these issues is because they have different sets of values, then uh, that leads to yet other conclusions about the sort of strategy one would use if you're going to try to change their, their attitudes. Let me give you just one example. Um, I haven't had time to I provide you with much in the way of empirical uh, work here, but I'm going to uh, just quickly uh, tell you a little bit about uh, some work that I've done. And the question is, are people intolerant in specific cases because they disapprove of particular characteristics or because they generally dislike outgroups? Uh, and I'll give you some examples of what I mean. So if people say, for example, that they wouldn't be very keen on living next door to a gay person, is that because they disapprove of homosexuality or because 
they're just not very keen on others, that is, out groups in general. And the same thing with immigrants and with drug users. Well, the rather remarkable finding is that subjective intolerance has a larger effect than disapproval of whatever the defining characteristic is. So I uh, just to tell you briefly what the, the model was, uh, we had a battery of questions, this is from the European Values Study, on groups of people you uh, wouldn't like to live next door or have as neighbors. So those would be you know, gays, Asians, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and you could drop out the homosexuals from that list and see how many different sorts of people uh, the respondent would not like to have as neighbors. And that turned out to be a better predictor of whether they would not like to live next door to a homosexual than the respondent's view about homosexuality. Okay? So it's a fairly remarkable finding. And that applied not just to homosexuality, but to immigration and to, to drug use. Um, in other words, there's a kind of generalized uh, intolerance or prejudice that's actually more important than the specific view about the characteristic of the uh, kind of people we're concerned with. Well, just to give you a little bit of context for this, uh, previous work on tolerance was mostly from politics, and it goes back to the 1950s in the US. It's about the willingness to grant civil rights to people who are disliked. And I, it was typically in the 50s, but then for the reasons that Alison explained, these questions have uh, carried on being asked for years and years, had to do with how you felt about communists, socialists, and atheists uh, being allowed to speak in public, to teach in universities, and so on. Um, well, over time, people have gradually, in America, become more willing to see communists, socialists, and atheists who have some of these civil rights, uh, from which it was very tempting for many people to conclude, this is wonderful, we're becoming a more tolerant society, extending civil rights to uh, large numbers, and so on. Actually, I think the kind of analysis I've just given explains what's going on. It's not that Americans love communists more than they did before. It's they simply see them as less of a threat. Um, they, or it's, it's, sorry, it's not that they are more committed to civil rights than they were before. It's that they have uh, either less negative views about those particular groups or they simply see them as less important and so not worth worrying about. Um, and more recent work has tended to suggest that actually uh, there hasn't been so much a value shift in the direction of greater tolerance as um, some of those, those results were seeming to suggest. A more sociological approach has typically been on prejudice, sometimes just to do with feelings as measured by a feeling thermometer, for example, on a scale from not to 100, where a 50 is neutral, how do you feel about uh, uh, some particular type of person? Uh, another approach has been the social distance uh, inventory, particularly the Bogardus scale, where uh, someone is asked whether they're willing to accept a particular kind of person as, uh, on the one hand, a close relative by marriage, through to, at the other uh, end of the scale, not even have in the, the country. Well, just to sum up, my claim has been that what attitudes are, and that's the ontology bit of the title of the whole symposium, affects how they should be measured, though I haven't had much of a chance to explain why that's the case, that's the method bit, and how they can be changed. So that's the impact part of the title. Um, specifically, I've talked about tolerance, the willingness to permit some sort of person X to do some kind of action why that's affected by beliefs, feelings, and values. Um, I've suggested that intolerance seems to exist in some generalized form. Um, I think it's also plausible to suggest that it applies to multiple contexts, so multiple Ys as well as multiple Xs. In fact, um, you, know, you could define different kinds of prejudice or intolerance uh, about uh, the, the differing relationships between kinds of 
people at some sorts of things that you would allow them to do. Um, Intolerance, I think, can't be explained simply as a consequence of the disapproval of some specific characteristic. Uh, it's more likely to result from a general distaste for people that are, 